Greetings, this is Greg. The Fokker DR-1 is probably the most famous German fighter of the First World War, possibly the most famous airplane of World War I. However, it wasn't the best fighter of the war, certainly not the fastest, nor was it the most successful. Its fame comes largely from its association with the World War I ace of aces, Manfred von Richthofen, also known as the Red Baron. Most of Richthofen's later victories were in this plane, and he was ultimately shot down and killed while flying a Fokker DR-1. Regarding the DR-1's performance, Richthofen said, quote, it climbs like a monkey and maneuvers like the devil, unquote. That's an interesting description, probably having to do with the parlance of his time, but it does paint an accurate picture. The DR-1 could outclimb the vast majority of World War I airplanes, at least up to about 12,000 feet or so, and it was one of the most maneuverable planes of the war. People tend to attribute these characteristics to the fact that it's a triplane. However, the reality is that the DR-1's capability had everything to do with wing and propeller design and not the fact that it had three wings. You see, there was sort of a triplane craze going on in the 1916 to 1917 period. Craze really isn't the right word. Maybe a triplane trend or phenomenon would be better. During World War I, aircraft development was happening so rapidly that it was outpacing aircraft understanding. In other words, someone might try something and it would work, but the reason it worked would be misunderstood and cause subsequent projects to go off in the wrong direction. I'm sure there's a name in engineering or human factors for this sort of phenomenon, but I don't know what it is. Here's how I think it started. Early in the war, most fighters were monoplanes. The Fokker Eindeckers were the most famous of these, but the French Moraine Saulnier Bullet was another and was arguably the first fighter plane. By the way, in this video, we have French, German, Dutch, British, and U.S. names. So I apologize in advance if my pronunciation doesn't match the region of the world where you live. Soon, these monoplanes were eclipsed by biplanes. The Newport 17 showed up, and then the Albatross D2, and these biplanes vastly outperformed the older monoplanes. So you can see how one might conclude that two wings were better than one and thus logically three would be better still. Then the Sopwith triplane was introduced in December of 1916 and it was a good airplane and they were put into the hands of some skilled pilots thus had quite a bit of success. The Sopwith triplane is another story but looking at it through an early 1917 aviation lens you can understand why the Germans and everyone else focused on and attributed its success to its most obvious feature, the three wings. Thus, the triplane phenomenon really got going. The triplane phenomenon is the term NASA uses for this. It's not my term. Speaking of NASA, the main source of information for this video comes from NASA's book, Quest for Performance. There's also quite a bit here from Aerodynamics for Naval Aviators. These books and all the other non-copyrighted materials I use in creating these videos, for example, pilots' manuals, wartime documents, and so on, can be found in my Patreon section please consider joining. It's quite inexpensive. And please like and subscribe if this is the type of content you enjoy. Back to our story, the triplane phenomenon really got going in 1917. The Germans, having seen the success of the Sopwith triplane and having tested a captured one, were so impressed with its performance that for a short period of time, they went nearly all in on this triplane idea. No less than 34 German triplane fighters were constructed and test blown, and it wasn't just the Germans. During World War I, a total of about 90 triplanes were built by various countries, which represents the vast majority of all the triplanes built in aviation history. Of course, the triplane was not the end-all be-all of fighter design, and it was a very short-lived idea before being replaced by newer biplanes. And then, of course, there was a trend back to monoplanes. After the war, the biplane versus monoplane contest continued for about another 15 years before the monoplane ultimately prevailed, at least in most civil and military applications. It's worth noting that of those 90 triplanes built and test flown in World War I, only two saw service in significant numbers, the Sopwith triplane and the Fokker DR-1 triplane. The reason for that is because, as a general rule, the triplane isn't really a good idea. But these two planes, the Fulker triplane and the Sockwith triplane specifically, had other advancements that overcame the inherent drawbacks of the triplane design. 
I need to be clear that while the Sopwith triplane inspired and led to the Fulker triplane, the Fulker was not a copy. It's a totally different design. While most people assume that it's the three wings that gave the DR-1 its legendary climb rate and maneuverability, it's not. Three wings doesn't necessarily mean more wing area because they're usually smaller wings. For example, the Sopwith Pup has more wing area than the Fulker DR-1. The Pup is also lighter and thus has slightly lighter wing loading. The Sopwith Camel, which is the British plane most similar in performance to the DR-1, also has more wing area, although it's a bit heavier and slightly disadvantaged in wing loading. All other things equal, a triplane design has a disadvantage in total drag over a biplane due to something called interference drag. In locations on a plane where two or more components that are exposed to the slipstream join together, you get some additional drag, and that's called interference drag. The biggest source of interference drag is typically where the wings join together with the fuselage. On a typical triplane, you have two wings joining the fuselage, giving roughly twice as much interference drag. That's a big drawback. So if it has a disadvantage in interference drag and no real advantage in wing area, where is this legendary performance coming from? It's coming from a few things, but the key was the new wing design. Up until this point, it was thought that a thin wing profile was the key to speed. It's not known why that was the thinking. It could be because they did flawed wind tunnel testing or perhaps just because bird's wings were thin. Maybe it was because any thicker wings tested were of such poor design that they performed badly. I just don't know. I think that's lost to history. But whatever the case, on most World War I aircraft, airfoil thickness was between 4 and 6% of the wing's cord the cord being the line from the leading edge of the wing to the trailing edge. Along come the Germans with their Göttingen 298 airfoil section with a thickness 13% of the cord. 13, roughly two to three times thicker than most other wings in use at the time. This picture should help, and I apologize to our German friends for my pronunciation. The Göttingen 298 gave a lot of lift relative to the amount of drag it produces. The extra thickness also allowed for more internal structure to strengthen it, reducing the need for a lot of external bracing and wires which cause drag. This worked amazingly well, and it's this wing profile that's the main key to the DR-1's performance. Let's take a look at some actual numbers. This is a chart from NASA with specifications for a number of World War I aircraft. It's in uh, normal U.S. measurements, not metric, but we're really only looking at these for comparative purposes, so the unit of measurement doesn't matter much here. I'll box in the DR-1's numbers to make this a bit easier to follow because I'm going to have to explain all the columns from left to right. Trust me on this, it's going to shed some light on just how well the DR-1 performs and why. The first number, 110, that's just horsepower. The next number is the aircraft's gross weight. In this case, it's the weight of the plane in pounds with an average pilot, full fuel, full oil, and ammunition. The next column is the aircraft's empty weight. You should be seeing 894 pounds if you're following along correctly. Next, we have the wingspan, 23.9 feet. After that, aircraft length, again in feet, then 207 square feet of wing area. Next up, we have the wing loading, which is simply the gross weight we covered earlier, divided by the wing area, correction, divided by the wing square footage. It's notable that the DR-1 has a lower wing loading than any other plane here except the DH-2, and the DR-1 has slightly lower wing loading than the Sopwith Camel. 11.7 is the power loading, meaning 11.7 pounds per horsepower. Next, we have the maximum level flight speed and stall speed for the DR-1, 103 and 45 miles per hour, respectively. Now, these last four will really help explain the DR-1's performance, but they will take some explanation. We have the zero lift drag coefficient, which is 0 0.0323. The lower the number here, the more aerodynamically clean the plane is. As you can see, the only plane on this chart better in this regard is the Sopwith Dolphin, which wasn't introduced until 1918 and doesn't have a radial engine, and it's only slightly better. The DR-1 has a significant advantage here over its arch rival, the Sopwith Camel. The next number is drag area. 
This means that the drag of the DR1 when at zero lift is equal to a flat disk with 6.69 square feet of area. On this list, only the Fokker D8 is better, which is a monoplane with a similar wing profile to the DR1's wings. I can't really overstate how important this number is. Compare it to the number for a Sopwith Camel, Spad 13, Newport 17, or Albatross D3, and it's clear how slippery the DR1 was in comparative terms. I should state that by modern standards, or even standards just 10 years later, the DR1's drag is quite high, but at the time it was remarkably low for a rotary engine fighter. The 4.04 number is the wing aspect ratio. That's the ratio of wing span to mean cord. In other words, a high aspect ratio means it's a long wing with a short distance from leading edge to the trailing edge. As an example, the Fokker D8 monoplane has one long wing, thus a high aspect ratio. The DR1's three wings are relatively short compared to their cord, so low aspect ratio. As a very general rule, in World War I airplanes, a higher aspect ratio is better. The reason is because high aspect ratio wings have less induced drag, which is to say less drag from the wings producing lift. Induced drag is a relatively large part of the plane's total drag at low speeds where World War I airplanes operate. Again, it's a very general rule, and as planes get faster and faster, this general rule becomes less and less true. But World War I airplanes are pretty slow. Thus, as long as you can build the wings strong enough so that it won't break, a high aspect ratio is desirable down in the World War I era speed range. The DR-1 had good performance not because of its low aspect ratio, but in spite of it. Now, a low aspect ratio does improve roll rate, so there is that. Last, we have the L over D max of 8.0. This is a very important number. L over D max represents the wing's efficiency and is only maximized at a specific speed and angle of attack. When being flown at the right speed and angle of attack for L over D max, the DR1's wings will generate eight pounds of lift for every pound of drag. This is better than the Sopwith Camel, and only the later Folkers and the Sopwith Dolphin have a better number here. So at 1290 pounds, if flown at L over D max, the triplane's three wings, plus the little wing between the main wheels, which does count, will have 162 pounds of drag. The Sopwith Camel will have 192. This makes a big difference because those drag numbers will increase massively with load factor. For example, in just a 2G turn, it will triple, giving the DR1 486 pounds of drag and the Camel 576. The higher the G load in the turn, the bigger the drag advantage for the DR1. Thus, as compared with the Camel, an amazingly maneuverable airplane in its own right, the DR1 has slightly lower wing loading and a slightly lower stall speed. The Camel has a slight edge and power to weight ratio, but has to overcome much higher drag in turns. The DR1's advantage here is entirely due to wing design. With its lower stall speed, it has slightly better instantaneous turn performance for a given G-load, and with its lower drag, the DR1 will have better sustained turn performance as well, as compared to the Camel. Now, in reality, both pilots of DR1s and of Camels reported that they could outturn the other. The numbers here favor the DR1 in any turn contest, but the realities of combat will come into play. One pilot may be more skilled than another, or perhaps one pilot may be unwilling to put much G-load on the airplane. This would probably have been more common with DR1 pilots, as some triplanes had come apart in the sky, and the pilots knew that. There were different sources for data. I'm using data from NASA, which I'm sure is pretty good, but construction quality varied, and since these planes are so close, I have to consider that a really well-made camel versus a DR1 with quality control issues might tip the balance the other way. The point I'm making is that the DR1's turn performance is so good not because it's a triplane, but because the Gottingen wing design allows for a lot of lift without a lot of drag. But the DR1 had one other trick up its sleeve. Its propeller was pitched to provide maximum performance at its best rate of climb speed, not to maximize the plane's top speed as propellers often were in World War I. As best climb speed is very close to best sustained turn speed, the prop was essentially optimized for dogfighting, not for speed, not for economy, 
but for climb and sustained turn performance. So while it's true that the DR1 had good climb performance and great turn performance, this had nothing to do with it being a triplane. The triplane design was really just the result of a passing fad, one not based in science or aerodynamics, but in faulty logic and reactionary engineering. The truth is that the DR1's performance was the result of a big step forward in wing design with that Gottingen wing and the low pitch propeller. Those same techniques, when combined with the biplane design, resulted in Fulker's excellent D7, which was made even more formidable by combining that airframe with an overcompressed engine. I have a video about that if you're interested. Link in the description. Fulker then went to a monoplane design using the lessons learned up to that point. The D8 seen here had excellent performance considering its relatively simple and low-powered engine. I hope you found this video informative. Please like and subscribe, and please consider joining my Patreon, where you will find all the documents I used in the creation of this video. Thanks for watching, goodbye, and have a great day. Oh, and just one more thing, a final bit of trivia, and that's all it is, trivia really. The Göttingen wing is so called because it was from the Göttingen University, where Ludwig Prontl did a lot of the development work on it. The Supermarine Spitfire of the Second World War can trace its wing plan form back to Prantle as well, creating sort of a loose DR1 Spitfire connection. I talk about that quite a bit in this video, link in the description.